Hello Info Person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss something that might appear kind of mundane, but it's something that surprised everyone. We're going to discuss ice, water ice. Something that's pretty much all over the place on planet Earth, but something that really surprised the scientists extremely recently because apparently, even though scientists always thought that ice was electrically inactive, a recent study you can find in the description unveiled some truly fascinating and groundbreaking results in regards to electrochemical properties of this very common substance. And it turns out that ice is not electrically inert after all. In fact, it can generate electricity when it's bent or unevenly deformed. A phenomenon referred to as flexoelectricity. And in this case, water ice seems to even exhibit very peculiar flexoelectricity on its surface, especially at much colder temperatures. And as you can imagine, the discovery has quite a lot of implications, ranging from potentially new technologies to just better understanding of things that seem to be happening on our planet, including, of course, lightning during thunderstorms. And so let's unpack this a little bit more, talk about the study itself, and find out what this is all about. But to start, let's discuss this somewhat unknown concept known as flexoelectricity, and compare it to something else you might be familiar with, such as piezoelectricity. If you want to read about this concept in detail, and want to find out exactly how this works in various materials, this study by Mieszko Kolodziersz, with a super difficult to pronounce Polish name, explains this in a lot of detail. But in a nutshell, flexoelectricity refers to production of electricity as a result of something flexing or bending. And so here imagine a piece of material that's somewhat flexible and can be bent. And when you bend something, one side gets stretched or experiences something known as tensile strain, while the other side gets compressed, referred to as the compressive strain, which of course creates uneven distribution as a result of this deformation. And it's this unevenness that scientists refer to as strain gradient. And flexoelectricity is essentially the coupling between the strain gradient and electrical polarization. Or let's just rephrase this. When any material experiences some kind of an uneven deformation, in theory, it can generate polarization and electric charge. So here you can think of it as a tiny, tiny battery forming inside any material due to bending. And what's really crucial about flexoelectricity is that this is a universal property. Unlike some other ways of generating electricity, flexoelectricity can exist in any dielectric material, regardless of the crystal structure or symmetry, even if the structure is perfectly arranged and contains no initial deformations. And so even perfectly symmetrical crystal can easily become flexoelectric when it's bent a little bit. And that's because here the act of bending basically breaks the symmetry at the local level. But to really grasp why this is significant for us, we also need to compare this to the more commonly known phenomenon, piezoelectricity. And this is something that's probably familiar to most of us because it's used in a lot of technologies around us. For example, lighters, speakers, and even a lot of sensors usually rely on piezoelectricity for the production of electricity or for a lot of other purposes. And here these materials generate electric charge when subjected to uniform mechanical strain. So basically some kind of a stretching or some kind of a compression. Here's a typical piezoelectric disc, in this case used in a buzzer. But the key difference here is that piezoelectricity is only found in materials with extremely specific non-symmetrical crystal structures, such as for example zircon crystals, which are very often used for this function. That's actually how for many decades clocks used to keep time. By using piezoelectric properties of zircon crystals, it was possible to create controlled imbalance of charge that would then be used in various sensors, actuators, and transducers. But naturally, a lot of substances are not piezoelectric, and that of course includes ice 1H, which is the official name for water ice that exists on our planet. And it's called 1H because this is the first form that's hexagonal in shape. You can actually learn about some of the more bizarre types of ice out there in some of the previous videos in the description. And so despite the fact that water molecules are polar, the way they usually arrange themselves in common ice forms a geometrically random structure where hydrogen is randomly oriented and does not have any long-range order for tiny dipoles to then form piezoelectric effects. Which by itself is actually also a puzzle because it's not entirely certain why crystals of ice form this way and why they don't seem to possess natural electric properties. And so for years this question remained. If ice isn't piezoelectric, how exactly can ice generate electricity under mechanical stress 
as sometimes observed during natural events. Although I guess the biggest question here has always been about generation of lightning inside thunderclouds, because here it seems to involve collisions of a lot of ice particles, which then are able to generate electrical charges leading to lightning bolts. But in essence it was not entirely clear how all of this happens. And the answer in this case, based on the study, seems to be flexoelectricity. And this has now been demonstrated by preparing so-called ice capacitors, or layers of ultra-pure ice frozen between two gold-coated aluminum electrodes, where the charge was then measured by using a very specific tool. And so here by applying an oscillating three-point bending deformation, researchers were able to precisely measure the applied bending and the resulting electrical charge, which allowed them to calculate the flexoelectric coefficient for these pure ice particles. And what they discovered was quite remarkable. Ice is indeed flexoelectric with the coefficient of 1.14 nanocoulomb per meter. And just to give you a bit more perspective, this is actually comparable to some of the more advanced ceramic materials, like for example strontium titanate or even titanium dioxide, which are actually used in a lot of different technologies for this exact purpose. And so this is not some kind of a minuscule theoretical effect, this is a robust measurable property that potentially has a lot of application. But in this case the discoveries didn't stop here, because researchers also decided to vary the temperature in order to observe how these effects change over time. And surprisingly they discovered some kind of an unexpected anomaly that seems to happen at much lower temperatures, around 160 Kelvin or minus 113 degrees Celsius, which is like what, minus 700 Fahrenheit or something? Uh, okay, let me just look it up real quick. Minus 170 Fahrenheit. So below these temperatures, for some unknown reason the flexoelectric effect seems to dramatically increase reaching the peak of about 7.6 nanocoulomb per meter, or essentially five times as high. And this seems to happen in materials usually undergoing some kind of a ferroelectric phase transition, which basically implies that sometimes ice seems to be also ferroelectric. Okay, let's discuss ferroelectricity very briefly, just so that you know what we're talking about. And so imagine some kind of a material where tiny electric dipoles, or these tiny molecular magnets, are naturally aligned in a specific direction. They basically create some kind of a natural net electric polarization. But crucially this polarization can be reversed if you apply an external electric field, resulting in similar effects to flipping of poles inside a magnet. So here ferroelectricity refers to a kind of a separation of positive and negative charges inside the material. And a lot of ferroelectric materials usually exhibit this behavior below a critical temperature referred to as Curie temperature. And so below this temperature, atoms in ferromagnetic materials usually spontaneously align to create a very strong magnetic field, kind of like for example in iron, when it reaches a temperature of 770 Celsius or 1400 Fahrenheit. But the strange part in this experiment is that this ferroelectric behavior wasn't occurring in the bulk of the ice. The mechanical and structural analysis showed no signs of the bulk phase transition, and instead it was found to be a ferroelectric phase transition only happening near a surface region or skin layer of the tiny pieces of ice. Or just to rephrase this, only the surface of water ice was becoming ferroelectric and was exhibiting these bizarre properties, but not the rest of the ice structure. And this is quite unusual. Here this property only manifested on the surface and only at certain temperatures. And I guess just to add to the mystery here, something else affected the strength of ferromagnetism when the scientists were measuring the ice. Here even the type of metal used for the electrodes influenced the surface ferroelectric effect. For example when using platinum electrodes, they measured the larger flexoelectric peak compared to gold, whereas aluminum electrodes showed almost no peak at all which to the scientists behind the study implied some kind of a strong interaction between the surface of ice and the electrode used for measurements, and specifically some kind of an electron transfer that was driven by the surface ferroelectricity, suggesting that the environment seems to play a direct role in producing a lot of these flexoelectric effects as well. But I guess the question is, so why would this matter and why is this important? Well for one, it might give us some clues about thunderstorm electrification. For a long time scientists have known that lightning forms when ice particles in clouds collide and become electrically charged. 
which then eventually results in a discharge we refer to as lightning. But as I have mentioned previously, we also know that ice is not piezoelectric, so any kind of a deformation or any kind of a pressure should not actually produce this electricity. And so the mechanism for discharge separation has been elusive and created a long-standing problem in atmospheric science. But this study presents us with at least one clue. Here scientists demonstrated that when small ice particles collide with larger but slightly softer particles, kind of resembling typical hail, these impacts can cause uneven mechanical deformations and bending, with the strain gradient generating tiny electric charge. And the calculations by the researchers in the study show that flexoelectric charge density seems to be comparable to what we do observe inside thunderclouds when it comes to generating electricity over time. And so this presents us with maybe one potential and very exciting explanation. But even more strikingly, the study also discovered that the signs of flexoelectric coefficients can dramatically reverse at much higher temperatures, usually above minus 25 Celsius or 248 Kelvin. And this reversal in the direction of charge separation aligns with decades of experimental evidence showing temperature-driven polarity reversal in thunderstorm charging, a phenomenon that's considered to be key to the formation of thunderstorms' complex electrical structure. Or I guess to rephrase this, it means that ice particles colliding at different altitudes, or essentially at different temperatures, generate opposite charges. And so upper storms that are usually very cold and mid-levels that are usually much warmer create completely opposite charges that then potentially create lightning, which actually explains the charge generation inside clouds in an entirely new, novel way. And so the calculations from the study and the flexoelectric hypothesis seems to provide an intriguing explanation for a lot of atmospheric phenomena. But beyond natural phenomena, we obviously have certain applications in technology. For example, materials with electromechanical properties are usually vital for various sensors. And since here scientists discovered that ice exhibit flexoelectricity directly comparable to various expensive ceramics, suggests that in theory, in certain conditions, it might be possible to create something much cheaper by just using ice, especially when it comes to using this in, for example, outer space or in permanently cold conditions. Or even more importantly, imagine building devices in cold conditions on site, for example, in the polar regions or even on icy planets or icy moons. And so in theory, this could lead to a lot of new electronic devices that use ice as an active material harnessing its unique properties and creating something where other materials might actually struggle. And so, from what seems to be just a simple block of ice, here scientists were able to discover an entire new world of complexity and mystery, with these flexoelectric discoveries fundamentally changing our entire understanding of ice and of course demonstrating that even the materials we think we understand and sometimes take for granted still hold a lot of scientific surprises. But if you've enjoyed this video, check out some of the other videos about water ice in the description below. We'll definitely come back and discuss this more once there are some additional discoveries. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access and a few more additional things. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye